Yeah, that looks okay. Yeah, that works. Okay. Perfect. Uh, let's start because we're a few minutes late. So I'll be talking about Node.js uh, application security or insecurity. Um, so before I do that, who am I? Well, my name is Leo Von Spudel, which is what it said on the first slide. I work for a company called IOActive, uh, my colleagues in the right there. Um, I, I'm the director of penetration testing for IOActive. Uh, I'm, I basically, you know, I, I, I do pen tests or lead pen tests. I, mostly my job revolves around reading code, testing code, breaking code, um, hopefully breaking code. Um, and so, um, yeah, I break stuff for the top, basically. All uh, right, so what's, the, so what's my agenda? What are we going to talk about today? Uh, so I'll say a few words about <laughs> what I'll be talking about, and then sort of uh, give you my target audience. Um, and then I'll sort of dive into well, what exactly is Node.js and why am I looking at Node.js? Um, and then I sort of start diving into actual details, right? I spend a little bit of time with the entry points. Um, Node.js entry points are really easy, so that's like one slide. And then I sort of dive into these are all the things that can go wrong when a Node.js application works. More uh, precisely, these are all things that will go wrong when you look at a Node.js application. Um, and then I have kind of a conclusion, and I, I'll, uh, after that, I can leave it open for questions. Right, so this talk isn't about Node.js itself. It's not about bugs in Node.js. Um, it is in bugs in Node.js applications. It's, it's kind of a subtle difference, but it's, it's a big difference, right? One is all native code, one is all JavaScript. Um, very different types of bugs. Um, there's a little bit of crossover. Near the end, I'll, I'll dive into a little bit of Node.js details, and you'll see a little bit of CSC++ code. Uh, but that's really just to give a bit of context around Node.js application stuff. Um, right. So my audience is kind of just sort of threefold, right? If you're a Node.js developer, you are you are definitely my target audience. I would I would love for you to come here and hear this, and hopefully you know um, learn what not to do or learn what bugs are like and how to fix them. Uh, obviously, my, my uh, secondary target audience is you know, security people, right? I, I, I am one of you, and so I, I'm here to sort of spread some of the knowledge, I, or hopefully some of the knowledge that, uh, that I've gained about Node.js. Um, so it's basically sort of, if you're a security reviewer, you, what you could learn would be uh, you know, what to look for and where to look for it if you're ever involved in a Node.js security review. Uh, and then obviously, the, the, the third um, target audience is you know if you're just a, a curious web guy or you're, you're no dot just is really your thing or neither of those your things but you like security then this this could be interesting right right so what exactly is no dot yes um, well no dot yes is basically a server side uh, environment for most web applications you also write web services and a bunch of other things uh, and the whole thing is written uh, the whole thing runs on JavaScript it's a JavaScript environment. Um, it's based on Google's V8 engine, so it's a, the same JavaScript engine that runs in Chrome, basically. Um, <coughs> they uh, they bolted their own APIs and framework on top of it. Um, it, it everything is single-threaded, um, so they had a bunch of SQL APIs. Uh, this is a small list, but the list is really like actually really long. And the web, the Node.js website has a full list of all the areas of things that they add because uh, obviously files, crypto. Um, and like execution uh, processes, but also like there's networking and, and a, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, I, I listed these four because these are the things I'll dive into during this presentation. Um, so that's just the C++ APIs, and then on top of that, they have a, a fairly big um, JavaScript runtime that they actually expose to the developer. And those, I mean, that runtime is basically just a bridge between C++ stuff and, and uh, the application. Right, so why am I looking at Node.js? Well, um, I mean, Node.js, I mean, is, is, I mean it's, it's, pretty com it's in pretty common use nowadays. A lot of people write Node.js. Um, and so, so the reason I sort of got here is because I've been mildly involved in a, a few little Node.js applications, and then one of my colleagues said, hey, we need someone to write like a full-on loaded Node.js penetration <coughs> methodology. Uh, and writing those things takes effort, so I went ahead and started playing with this stuff and sort of Making a list of like, if I'm going to pen test these things, I would do this, and I would for this, and I would do this, and then you know that can go wrong, and this can go wrong, and that can go wrong, and so forth and so on. Um, and so after you know a while, I had this entire list, and then that engagement never really happened. Uh, but I had the stuff lying around, and then one of the organizers said, "Hey, Ilya, 
why don't you come speak at my conference? And, this, and they're like, well, okay, conference is what? It's called AppSec. It's all lost. There's a lot of web apps. I'm like, oh, great. I have this, this thing lying around um, that I haven't had any use for since. Um, I can come present it here. Um, and then, so it's definitely seemed to like that. Um, and that's kind of how this came about. Um, and so basically, hopefully, you know, I, people, people will learn a thing or two from it. Uh, one of the things I try to do is I try to um, uh, have some real world samples. And usually when I do these things, you know, I, uh, I go to SourceForge and I go download a bunch of sample applications and play with them. And I go to SourceForge and I couldn't find a single Node.js application in SourceForge. Not a one. The list of program languages doesn't even include Node.js. So I'm like, you know, why is this? What am I missing? And somebody goes, Ilya, you idiot. Uh, it's not a SourceForge. GitHub. GitHub's where you got to go. Um, and of course, GitHub wasn't my first point to go. Um, so I think maybe it's the time getting old. I'm stuck in the SourceForge group. World and apparently everybody we moved on to a GitHub world. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, right. So that's sort of the sort of intro. Um, so let's dive into some more details now. Um, what what does an actual Node.js application look like? Well, the cool thing about Node.js is that it's all built to be extremely easy to use. Right. Um, pretty much any Node.js standard application looks like this. Right? Where basically you say, okay, create me an HTTP server that uh, listens on uh, this port and, and binds to this address, and it just happens, right? And then you say, okay, you get a request, you get a response, I say this, you know, I, I parse the URL, I, I give you data, I'm done, right? That's how an app looks like, it's that easy, right? That's all you have to, like, that's your everything, that's your data, right? That's everything, it's, it, it's that easy to audit the stuff, right? You go look for this thing and you, Basically, find strategy point. Um, it really is that easy. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a number of frameworks built on top. So, and most people do tend because it, this is this is sort of uh, bare bones of .js. The frameworks give you a set of you know more useful or more elaborate APIs, and so people do tend to use the, the frameworks. Uh, one of the most common ones is called Express, which gives you uh, a, a super set of APIs, and it gives you these request routing methods and things like that. So it makes things easier. And then um, there's this sort of application development framework from the uh, eBay guys called uh, Kraken, uh, which gives you, on top of that, a set of other APIs, including you know, a bunch of security APIs and then those kind of things. Um, there's a long list of, of uh, frameworks. These are the two that I've looked at and that I know a little bit about. Um, right, so with that, let's dive into some Build.js security bugs. Um, I sort of made these three categories. Um, Modern web application bugs, uh, classic web application bugs, and sort of miscellaneous security bugs. And what I mean with, with modern, and we'll sort of dive into it, is I'll, I'll, this is sort of the standard web app stuff, like cross that scripting, cross that quest forgery, response splitting. And this is basically stuff like you're supposed to know what this is, but I'll, I'll sort of be like, okay, this is what it looks like in Node, and then if you're a developer, here's what we should fix. Uh, bear with me a little bit, I know this gets a, a little bit boring, uh, but there's really ju there's a lot to use your stuff, like once we get past this you know, modern web app stuff. Um, right, so cross-site scripting. Um, I, I would imagine, I would hope everybody in this room knows what cross-site scripting is. Is there anybody who doesn't know what cross-site scripting is? Perfect. Uh, <laughs> right, so you know that just given that it's, it's a, 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 this, uh, a wonderful JavaScript provider with the right web apps web service, and there's obvi obviously there will be tons of web apps written in Node.js. And so if, if you're a reviewer and you have to audit Node.js applications, you will find cross-site scripting bugs, I guarantee it. Reflect, store, that you'll, you'll see them come by. Um, Node.js has no magic API, there's no way to easily get rid of them, so they occur in, in Node.js okay, well. And so basically, if you go back to the simple sort of, you know, create server, and then listen to this port and support, and you do this URL parsing, it's sort of be okay. Well, I send data back to you, and I, and I echo name, and I just sort of these uh, uh, reflected cross-site scripting bugs. This is pretty standard stuff, like that's exactly what a cross-site scripting bug looks like. Uh, so more specifically, that's what it looks like in Node.js. No surprises there. Um, so yeah, if, you, if you're in Node.js applications, you will run into this stuff. Um, and now, uh, if you're writing Node.js applications, you should be aware of these, obviously, and you should uh, escape the input that you echo back out, uh, either be it directly from the user or when you get it from a database, right? Um, this is the standard function to do this stuff for HTML, is kind of like this, right? When you uh, sort of encode, you say, oh, less than, you make an ampersand LT um, semicolon, 
and there's a few of the others. That's sort of the standard way to do it, right? And after HTML, there's other ways for JavaScript, URL, XML, JSON, and so forth. Um, but I'm putting this in here in case, you know, some, uh, some node of Jet developer stumbles across this thing here for now and he goes, oh, what's this cross site scripting thing and how do I fix it? That's sort of the easy way to, to, to sort of get that stuff fixed. <coughs> Um, now, you know, obviously, and we all know this, if you, if you go and write your own escaping code and, and you have to call it every time, this is tedious stuff and it's error prone and, you know, we know you're not going to get them all. There's going to be like this one that you missed somewhere. Um, and so, uh, Node actually, uh, so Node, Node has this large uh, community of like, um, that publishes all these modules and it has this easy tool called NPM where you basically be like, oh, hey, fetch me this one, fetch me that module. Module and it all works relatively well, um, and so there's one of these modules for Node um, called uh, Node Validator. There's a few others, but uh, Node Validator is the one I looked at. Um, and Node Validator is basically sort of the okay, sort of um, you just include it and then you say okay, here's my string, escape it, you get escape string back, and you, you don't have to worry about anything else. If there's a corner case that's missed, it's no longer your fault. It's the guy who made the module's fault, right? Right, so that's sort of the standard uh, cross-site scripting stuff. Okay, um, obviously another one of these, I guess, modern web app type stuff. And it's not web app specific, but obviously SQL injection, right? We all know what SQL injection is. Um, and so, I mean, they, they, SQL injection bugs in Node look exactly the same as they do anywhere else, right? Again, no big surprises. Um, the one thing that you'll see, though, is that, uh, because Node is one of these sort of, you know, very typical uh, web 2.0 languages is that, you'll see this kind of aversion towards SQL. And so a lot of apps sort of try to go, they'll, they'll go to NoSQL, right? CouchDB or Mongo, or, or there's a long list of these. Um, which, you know, they come with their own set of problems, they don't really have SQL injection, but there are other problems. Um, but I'm not covering that here. Um, so one thing you'll see is that there is relatively little SQL injection in Node.js. It's obviously not impossible. I found examples. Um, and you can use SQL from uh, uh, Node. Also, uh, Node doesn't offer, um, uh, SQL drivers by default. They're all modules. So if you like, you want to use MySQL, for example, you do an npm, you know, install uh, MySQL driver, and then you get the MySQL driver, and you can use that, right? Um, and then obviously, when you have that, you know, you say, oh, you make a network connection, you say, oh, network connection dot, you know, execute query, you say query this, and you just pen to a string user input. This is a you know, classic, classic SQL injection. Again, no surprises here. Um, and I swear to God. There's a few more slides of these, but at some point I'm going to stop saying no surprises here because there will be a few surprises. Um, but and so basically, the next slide is sort of the you know. So I start looking uh, on GitHub for you know examples to show of what this looks like in real world, except in, in the real world. Um, and I didn't quite find a SQL injection, but I found I found a Yahoo query language injection, uh, which isn't quite as powerful, but it's still pretty cool. Uh, so uh, Yahoo query language allows you to query stuff from Yahoo. And it's very, the language is very, very SQL-like, and there's a module for this in Node.js, and it's sort of the, oh, you have know, query language selects from so and so and so, plus Weather City, and Weather City actually comes as input to the application. Um, and so I, I spent a little bit of time with uh, the yeah, query language, and it does actually allow you to have multiple selects in one, so you can actually append um, uh, stuff to it and query other data from this injection. Um, again, you know, SQL injections are no surprise at all. The way that we fix these things is to use, you know, paraphrased queries or prepared statements or depending on which one you come from, it'll, it'll, it'll be called one or the other, but they're pretty much the same thing. Um, uh, obviously, the golden rule if you're going to do SQL is that you must always, always um, use prepared statements um, if the data comes from an untrusted source or is dynamic in any way. Um, if you don't, you will have SQL injection, right? This is sort of the known rule. Um, I mean. It, if you look at the last couple of years in, in sort of AppSec, is that people have sort of gotten, because SQL injection is pretty bad when people, for the most part, have done things right. Every so often you'll see people, you know, do this kind of stuff, but, you know, usually things go, things go okay. <clears throat> right, so, okay, another, you know, common one, obviously, cross-site best for you. Well, uh, you know, yes, you can have this too um, in any of the yes. Again, no surprise there. Um, again, I'll, I'll assume that this audience knows what cross-site request forgery is. Um, again, this is not language dependent. You can see this in pretty much any web app, whether it's written in Node or ASP or uh, uh, Ruby or Rails or, or God knows what, right? Um, generally, when you see these things, it's, it's a sign that you have a, a, 
a crappy design for your web app, right? Um, now, I, it's hard to show actual example of Cosine Press Forgery in your code because Cosine Press Forgery is sort of the thing that it's the absence of code that makes a bug, right? Um, the thing I think I want to say about OLGS is that it doesn't offer native cross-site effects forgery protection. Um, and I think that it should, because a framework like this is the perfect place to be like, hey, we'll just we'll just offer the token generation and, 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 and marshalling of that stuff for you. You don't have to worry about it. Um, you know, a bunch of frameworks do it. I wish um, no, that just does it too. Um, <coughs> however, if uh, there are frameworks that do, so if you use eBay's uh, Croc and JS, for example, um, they offer the, you know, hey, we do a, a session token generation, and you can opt into this stuff. Um, so obviously, you know, again, this is pretty common advice. Um, if, if you if you're using Node.js and you must roll your own to do cross-site request forgery protection, <laughs> it's sort of the okay, this step of okay, you need to generate a graphically secure token and you need to put it in someone's uh, uh, session, and then you need to send it to them so that it's in their form, and then when they submit the form, compare it to, and if, 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 if they match, then great. Get request through. If they don't match, someone's trying to attack you, right? That's the basic idea. Um, you shouldn't roll your own. It's actually harder than it sounds. Um, cryptographically secure is not as easy as, as I make it out to be, and I will I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, even though, and also the interesting about the cross forgery forgery uh, mitigation or protection is that this sort of came about in the, I'd say earlier, maybe mid 2000s. Sort of right before we, we had this Web 2.0 model, and so the cross-site press forging protection is sort of the well, we're going to assume that you have a static HTML and then you do a request to us, and so what we're going to do is when we generate the HTML for you, we'll just put the the, the, the token in there and you submit it back, and that model doesn't fit that well in the Web 2.0 model where I'm not really sending you HTML anymore and you're not sending me all the stuff. All that's really happening is we're sending JSON back and forth, and so even though it may be cross-site request forgery. It's doing a token per request is one of these things where it gets really hairy. Um, so again, not as easy as it sounds. Um, <clears throat> obviously, basically my advice is to use, a, use something like Rocket.js um, for to protect against cross-site request forgery. Um, and you know, if the, the great thing about using libraries is that if things go wrong, it's not my fault; it's that guy's fault, right? Um, right. So okay, you know, sort of the last. Um, piece of the sort of modern web app stuff um, is HTTP responsibility. I'm assuming everybody in the room knows what HTTP responsibility is. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, uh, Node.js is actually kind of clever about this. It doesn't really allow for responsibility. That is to say, it has APIs to set a header and a header value. Um, you can't split the header value, but you can split the header name. Uh, so if you're in a rare situation where um, an attack gets full or partial control of a header name, uh, then that would allow for a, a response splitting. Um, it's rare. Um, I'm sure it's happened before. I'm sure there's a case for it somewhere. Uh, but it doesn't happen often. Um, this is what it would look like. This is a pretty complicated case, though, because I didn't really find an example for this, so I had to go make my own. Uh, but it's sort of the, yeah, I, I called her, um, you know, response out to header method. And this is this is my uh, my header name, and that's my header value. Except my header name contains, you know, a, a, a colon and the next line. And then you know, if you look at um, look at the actual, you know, you connect to this uh, to an application like that, and then search, sure enough, you'll see there's a header injection there, right? Um, so responsibility only works with the header name, not with the value. Um, basically, that means no yes almost in all cases you don't have to worry about responsibility. Node.js does it for you. Um, in, in the extremely rare case where you have to set uh, the header uh, name instead of the header value or, or where an attacker has control over the header name, um, you do have to worry about this stuff. Uh, obviously, you know, you have some options, right? I mean, you can do whitelist or blacklist. Like, am I just going to filter out the next line? Or if you send me the next line, am I, am I just going to say failed request? Or, so there's a few of these options that are relatively easy to do. All right. So far for the modern web app security uh, bugs. So now we're going to sort of classic web app security bugs. And this will be sort of reminiscent of, you know, 90s style Perl CGI script uh, type bugs. Um, and then, like, I, I've seen some of this stuff in actual applications. 
Um, so, that, so the first one is eval, right? If you've ever done any kind of client-side JavaScript, uh, you know, programming or reviewing, you know what eval is, right? Eval is basically, you know, here's a string, and oh, by the way, this string is JavaScript, and go execute it, right? Uh, well, server-side server uh, JavaScript, Node.js, uh, also honors eval and has eval, and it works exactly the same way, and so it is exactly as bad as it sounds. If there is any piece of uh, attack control data that gets passed along that string, you now have server-side uh, JavaScript code execution. Um, this, is, this is really bad. Um, one case where you would see this is because, because you have this, this, the same core, you have all of these client-side um, JavaScript uh, libraries, that you can be like, oh, you know what, I'll just import those things in my Node.js application. Except those libraries are never made to run on the server side. And so, for example, you have some of these uh, legacy uh, JavaScript APIs that sort of part JSON where they go like, I'll take your string and then I'll just eval it. Um, yeah, if you port that to a Node.js application, you are completely over right? um, and this is, I mean, this one looks like, I, I kind of made a cool example where you say, Oh, you know, give me a calculation, and I'll calculate it for you, and I give you the result. And the way I do is you give me the calculation request, I pass it on to eval, which will perfectly calculate it and you give it, uh, because it's just eval's code, and then hands back the result. But also, you know, you get basically remote JavaScript code execution in this thing. Um, how do you fix this? Well, just don't do it, right? Uh, eval should be a banned API. It, it's just, it should never be okay on server side to call eval. Um, I was talking to uh, one of my one of my buddies, um, uh, and he was doing a security review, uh, and he found this one of these bugs that, that are just you know ridiculously easy. And he, he said, "Well, this is one of these bugs that I put that I categorize in the <laughs> your stupid bugs, where you go to a dev and the dev goes, oh, you know what? I, I fix this immediately, and no one no one will ever notice." Um, and so I, 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 uh, I'd like to put forward that I think eval files in the same, you know, your stupid bugs. That is, if somebody comes to you and says you have an eval bug, you know, it's like priority, like drop everything else, fix this thing, and then sort of make sure no one ever know, knows that you put that bug there, right? Um, so eval is one. Another thing that, uh, so the um, Node.js JavaScript uh, uh, APIs, I mean, they're rich, right? It gives you a lot of access to the OS, gives you a lot of access to the file system, uh, and so it gives you access to run arbitrary commands. And so there's one particular API called, uh, if you require child process, and then you say, out of this uh, child process object, call the exit method, um, that is basically the uh, rough equivalent of the uh, C system API, which basically means, you know, you get a command line shell in, in, your, in your application, you say, oh, you know, do this, pipe to that, and then pipe this application and send a call and do this, and all of that stuff will just work, right? Except if you get any kind of user input in there, I mean, that's, that's basically like command line injection, right? That's really bad. Um, we know that's bad. We, we've known this for a very, very long time. Uh, um, and, and yet, uh, I, I've seen this particular bug in, in node applications that we've audited. Um, and, and, um, and so the sort of equivalent of this is this sort of there's another one called sort of exec, which is called spawn, which doesn't just which doesn't give you a shell of slides to execute one command, um, which is sort of which is the better way to go. Um, it forces off one process and just runs one command. Um, but even then, there, if you just uh, pass on arbitrary uh, arbitrary commands um, that come from an uh, uh, untrusted uh, in input, um, you might have like command line switch injection, right? Um, and this is what it would look like. And this is uh, this is this is a real world example. This is something I found on GitHub, where it says, okay, um, I think you use express something like it, where it says, oh, this is this is a post. We route the slash and code uh, post requests that come in, and we say, oh, I upload an image. Okay, and say uh, encode image name, and bam, right? If, if if I give my image name and I put a couple silly columns in there, it's game over, right? Um, so. Basically, uh, the advice would exec is sort of similar to eval, where it's like, just if, if it's a non-static string, don't do it, right? If it's a static string, I can see how you would do it, and it, it, it's probably okay. You're probably not going to have three bugs if it's a purely static string. Um, but if it's any non-static string, don't call exec on it. Really, really, really bad idea. Um, so, 
Um, how do you, what do you do then if you must call an application? Well, the best way to do it is to all, all of the sort of piping and so logic, well, you're going to have to do that in Go.js. And you can still go call external applications, and you need to call spawn or exec file. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's sort of the, but you're still passing untrusted content off to an application. Um, so you have to be careful, and you have to ask, does the, is the application built to handle this kind of input that I'm, that I'm this untrusted input that I'm giving you? Um, is there, maybe there's a kind of switch where, you know, if you have something that says dash dash exec to what you're adding something off to, then you get kind of fusion again, right? Um, so you have to make sure that the app is built to do that, and you have to make sure there's no switch injection. You have to make sure that there's the step of the, the steps of things that you have to get done uh, before you pass data off to an application, um, if you want to do it in some kind of secure way. Right, that was XX. Uh, yeah, another classic, you know, awesome bug is sort of the directory conversion. Um, yes, Node.js applications do have a, a file API, and that means if you don't filter correctly, you will have directory traversals. Um, it's basically, you know, slash, 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 and then if, if you don't filter for that stuff, um, then, you know, you'll, have, you'll be able to sort of any file to any user, right? And that's exactly what happens. Um, this is, again, another GitHub example I found where you say create server, and then the first thing you do is uh, read file, and the first argument is sort of the, okay, uh, um, HTTP root, and then append, my request URL, and then, oh, that file's there, I'll just serve it to you. Um, that works, um, and so I, I, you know, obviously, I was like, it can't be this easy, and of course, sure enough, I tested it. Yes, sure enough, I get my, I get my, uh, my password file back. Um, the really, really sad part is that this is sort of this, I mean, there's this community of like, you know, Dutch has developers, and they all post all this, this code, and so on GitHub, a very large number of them have code exactly like this, where they say, create server or request, oh, is this file, this is the file system, I'll just hand it off to you. Um, this is sort of the, yeah, I mean, Perl CGI script used to have these bugs, right? So it's like, yeah, you know, the 90s call, they want their bugs back. Um, yeah, the way to fix this is don't, don't do it, right? If, if, if you don't just serve files without doing any kind of validation on the file name, it's a really, really bad idea. Um, if you must serve file names, data back to the user based on file names in the actual file system, at least do validation, right? Make sure it doesn't have record reversals, right? Check for stuff like, you know, dot and dot dot and things like that. Um, right, that's pretty much it for file bugs, right? Right, so that's sort of the, so now I've had these sort of modern bugs, and then I've had these sort of classic bugs, and this is all stuff that's sort of pretty well known, and you know, if you're going to be any kind of web app tester, you should, this is all stuff you should probably know, and it's sort of the, okay, this is what it looks like in your touch, yes, okay. So now there's sort of these, uh, my last thing, sort of the things I stumble upon that don't really fit in, the, in those categories. Uh, some of it is known secure territory, some of it is sort of little quirks that are Node.js specific. Um, let's start first about random numbers, right? Which one of these things that we know about this stuff, but it's not web uh, specific, right? Um, so when I talked about cross site request forgery, right, I said, well, you should generate cryptographically secure tokens. Um, and then the, qu the next question you would ask is, well, how do you, how do you generate cryptographically secure tokens in Node.js, right? Well, the good thing you ask, right? Node.js has the C++ API, and one of them exposes the crypto object. One of the things you can get out of crypto is random bytes. And you go to the API and you say, crypto random bytes, what does that give me? And it says, well, it generates cryptographically strong pseudo-random data. Oh, it says cryptographically strong, I trust the documentation. If it's all good, I'll start using that, right? Now, there's a similar API um, in the crypto object, which is pseudo-random bytes. What does that say? It starts off saying, generates non-cryptographically <laughs> strong pseudo-random data. So this is non-cryptographically strong. Um, so basically, if we, if, if we just follow documentation, um, then we must have cryptographically strong, we use get bytes, otherwise we use the, the pseudo-random one, right? Uh, and this is, this is an easy rule, and this would apply to cross-site request forgery tokens. Right, and so when I talk about cross-site request forgery tokens, I said, okay, croc and JS, use that one, it, it'll do it right. Well, this is croc and JS code, and so what they do is when they generate tokens, they call the pseudo-random bytes. Uh, <laughs> which, of course, the coder documentation is wrong, right? Croc and JS should be using uh, the, the, the one that doesn't use the random one that uses randomly strong, right? That's what it looks like at first sight. Fortunately, it's not that easy, right? So when I saw this, I'm like, oh, well, you know, 
you know, couldn't, when they saw this one, it's like, oh, these, these stupid devs, they, they know any better. Yes, they, it turns out they do know better. Um, because I, I started looking at the, the, the actual APIs, and you look at the C++ APIs. Uh, and they kind of, you got, come out of this, and, because both, both of the, both APIs basically call the same function, but one of them basically says, I'm pseudo random, the other one says, I'm real random, right? So, if you, and it's basically our very thin wrappers around open and cell random code. Uh, ran pseudo bytes and ran bytes, right? And then so you basically go to, uh, okay, what does OpenSSL do with this stuff? And then, okay, let's go look at the documentation for um, OpenSSL. And for OpenSSL, the documentation says, yeah, I don't know if you can read it, but it basically says, well, the ran bytes one guarantees cryptographically strong, and the pseudo random one doesn't guarantee cryptographically strong, which matches almost one to one to the documentation of node.js. So basically, what they did is they, they wrapped the OpenSSL uh, API, they, they just copy pasted the documentation, and they said, Okay, there you go. Now it's open itself problem. So if I want to do, um, if, if I want to do uh, graphic strong tokens, I'll go use Crocker. And Crocker says, well, no just can API. No, no just says, well, actually, open itself gives me these APIs. And actually, if you look into the bowels of open itself, open itself doesn't just they have these crypto providers, and so they say it's this crypto provider's fault, and so they keep shifting all this blame, right? Um, the real problem, of course, is that getting cryptographically strong numbers. Um, is kind of a pain in the ass. Um, the way it works is that you have to, you know, you have to generate a feed and you sort of expand the entry. Um, and uh, you can't, it doesn't fit well in the Node.js model because Node.js, everything is asynchronous, right? And sort of the way you get really strong in the device is sort of the, let's sit here and wait until we get entry, right? And then that model doesn't really work so well. So what they, sh what they should do is sit there and wait, and of course they don't and they fail. Um, and so, um, if, if, if I'm trying to make a just application that's trying to be practical, I'm not going to use the cryptographic strong API because it doesn't work for the model. I'm going to go ahead and use the pseudo random one, keep my fingers crossed, and hope that it's cryptographically strong enough that it's not predictable. Um, so, how do we fix this? Well, I don't really know. I don't have a good answer to this. Uh, I mean, I guess you could pre allocate a large pile of random data, but then when that one's out, well, then maybe you should have a daemon that can just sits there and collects entropy. Well, what if you get more requests and you collect entropy? Or maybe the uh, APIs um, uh, should expose when you do the uh, non, when you get the pseudo random bytes, but when you get non crypto bytes back, non graphic strong bytes back. Well, maybe um, no one should expose that to developers. Maybe, maybe, maybe um, there's, I mean, this is a, sort of a, a bigger argument than sort of the, this is. But really, a talk hole itself. And in fact, it is a talk hole itself. Uh, my friend Dan Kaminsky did a talk about this at uh, DEF CON uh, last year. Um, and he has a couple of solutions, um, including sort of a, a, a user land, uh, cryptographically strong ish uh, pseudo random uh, number generator um, that he created. Uh, and it's called liburandy. And it's also supposed to work with Node.js, by the way. Um, so if you want better answers to this problem, uh, Go look at uh, Dan's talk. Right, so um, let's move on to the next, <laughs> the next uh, bit. Um, Node.js has this API called console.log, where basically anytime you, you run a Node.js application, you can just sort of get it spit out stuff to the console, which is really nice because it doesn't require any extra methods. It's just, it's just sort of baked in and allows you to spit out debug messages, right? Um, and if you look uh, on GitHub, which I did, um, and you see all these apps, and they're constantly using console to log get all sorts of debug information out. Um, it, oftentimes, where the console.log um, contains uh, uh, information that comes from untrusted sources, right? Um, what, it, so if you just sort of do like raw, uh, allow any kind of raw data to come through, I mean, that's not great. It's, it's not terrible, it's not, it's not bad per se, it's not a security bug on its own, but it's one of these things where it sort of spills over, right? It's like, well, if I, if I go inject stuff, if I go to a log file at some point, an administrator is going to start looking at this stuff. And this is where you get the sort of, sort of um, uh, problem, where um, the, generally the, the tools administrators use to look at log files, they're not really built to handle untrusted data, right? So if I get to um, inject arbitrary terminal escape codes into your log data, and the admin has that open in this terminal, depending on how good or how bad your terminal is, that may be really bad, and maybe your admin just got on, right? That's really bad. Um, the other one is, for example, that, um, you know, uh, by default, it just sort of 
prints out these uh, unprintable, non printable characters. So you get all these things where you could be like, oh, let's erase this line, or let's add a new one, or let's inject this stuff. So if, if, if one of the things you, you want to do is you want to um, fool an ad and seeing something that isn't there, or not seeing something that is there, uh, you can inject all these unprintable characters and sort of move, get things put on the screen or removed from the screen that aren't really there. Um, and so, custom lock raw injection isn't that bad, but you get all these weird side effects, right? Um, and so, I mean, a, a simple tip for this, right? You get console log and this thing goes through the network, and then you get all these sort of weird side effects. Um, yeah, how do you fix that? It's pretty easy. You basically do a, a wrap around and you say, every character that isn't within the known ASCII range, we're just going to ask, we're just going to hex escape that thing, right? And that sort of takes away the problem, right? Um, I, I, I think, I think, well, I, I really believe that Node.js should have had a second API, a console.log printable or something. Um, uh, but since it doesn't, if you're going to use console.log and you know you're going to get um, uh, untrusted data back in there, make a wrapper and basically go like, okay, anything that's not an ASCII range, we're just going to hex escape it. <clears throat> okay, so this is sort of uh, my, my last bit. This is sort of a Node.js specific um, sort of you know, work that I sort of stumbled upon that I think was pretty cute. Um, so Node.js is sort of meant to be this super fast, super performant, completely asynchronous, single threaded um, a, a, a framework, right? Um, and so it uses the V8 engine uh, underneath, you know, which is pretty good. But, you know, the problem with JavaScript, of course, is that um, you're using JavaScript data structures, so strings and arrays. And the problem with, with those data structures is that they obviously come with managed language overhead because that's that's what you want. You want it to be that way. But the, it kind of hits you on curve. So another JS guys basically said, okay, well, we, we'll still have those, but we will go create our own data structure called a buffer class. And what a buffer class really is is that it's a, this really, really thin layer implemented in C++ that basically gives you this, um, it basically wraps you in the leap. You get this, um, as a developer, you get this raw block of data that has just been located, and they go like, here you go. Uh, and when I say raw, I mean raw. Like, nothing's been in this size. It, it's, you get malloc from JavaScript, basically. <laughs> um, and the, the kind of scary part is that it's used every, like any node application you will see, they will use the buffer class. Um, and there's sort of three ways to use this buffer class, right? The first way is sort of to give it a length. It's really just malloc. It's like, Give me 100 bytes, and it gives, says, here's 100 bytes. Or uh, the more sane methods, which is sort of the, okay, I have this JavaScript array, uh, please do a malloc and just put the bytes there and give me the raw bytes, right? And the same thing with instead of an array, it's a string, right? If you use the array or a string, things probably are good. Um, of course, the length one is the one that's really worrisome, where basically you, from a JavaScript developer, you say, go to the node and say, hey, just give me 100 bytes. So, raw memory. What that means is it's all initialized, right? There's not a single byte initialized because that would be a perfect. Um, now, if you're a C and C++ developer, that's cool. You're used to that stuff. If you're a PHP developer or a JavaScript developer, this isn't stuff you're used to. You're, nobody ever told you to initialize data because you assume that it's initialized. Uh, and the reason they're not doing it is for perf reasons, but at the same time, your developers aren't used to getting that kind of raw memory. Um, and so this was really scary to me because the potential for heartbleed like bugs is enormous. I think they're just sitting out there, waiting out there. Um, I know the next time I'm going to go try to test um, a node on the case. This is the stuff I'm going to look for, right? Because if, if you run this thing and you have a self dot fit, like, and I can fish out your keys by just requesting data, you know that that's really bad, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I was reading over the, the buffer uh, documentation and reading this stuff, I'm like, really? They're really giving me back of data? Of course, couldn't believe it. So I open up the node and I say, give me a buffer 55. And sure enough, it gives me random whatever was there in the heap. And I do it again. And you get a different set of whatever's there on the heap. And every time you do it, so, and you see, start seeing these little structures in there. And you're like, okay, this, this must be some piece of undersized data. Um, so um, that's one thing about the... the the buffer part that I think is really scary. Uh, and while I was doing this, I was uh, sort of looking at sort of the other angle. Okay, I get undersized data, and, and that's really bad, and you get these hardly like things. But if I get raw data from, Java, from, from, from JavaScript, um, 
do, do I also get to just read and write anywhere I want? Um, so, how do I, so how do you read and write from these buffers? Well, um, the Node.js basically sort of gives you two ways of doing it, right? They have the, the bracket operator, and then there's these read and write uh, APIs, right? So the, bracket, the good thing about the bracket operator is that it does um, bound validation. So if you go out of bound the bracket operator, it's a, it goes screw you and it throws an exception, right? Which is exactly what you want. Now, the read and write APIs aren't quite as straightforward. The read and write APIs basically have, um, if you look at the documentation, they have this sort of, okay, well, if you do write and write this value and write this value, this opposite, oh, and there's this third optional argument which says no assert. And you're, okay, what does no assert mean? Well, no assert means that if I set it to one, uh, it won't throw an exception um, if you go out of bounds. Um, but it then goes on to say, um, uh, these bytes, if you go out of bounds, it will be silently dropped, right? That's what it says for the write API. Now you go to read API and it doesn't say that. It still says, oh, there's this optional no assert, uh, but if you don't, if you, if you turn that thing off, or if you, if you turn the no assert on, then it won't throw an exception. It doesn't explicitly mention um, that it will um, discard the out of bound index, right? Um, so I think that's strange that it doesn't explicitly say that. And I started playing with this. And it turns out that reality is stranger than the documentation. Um, in reality, um, all the read and write APIs for integers will silently ignore out of bound. Now, and then you start looking at the um, read and write APIs for floats and doubles. Um, when we write float doubles to, uh, to or from a buffer class, um, and they do not silently drop, it just goes through. So if I, if I basically go and say, um, uh, hey, write this flow to this index way past the buffer, it'll just write it. Um, I, I, it doesn't really match with documentation. So I think that's an implementation oversight. Um, I tested on uh, 0.10.31, which is now a few months old, but I suspect latest version has it too. Um, I'm hoping this will get fixed. I, I really think it's implementation oversight uh, because there's no, no reason why you have this kind of discrepancy. It doesn't make much sense. Um, again, if, if you want to start testing this, it's sort of the, yeah, you create a buffer and then you say, oh, buffer, reload outside, then you get a value back that's clearly outside of your range. Um, then when you say, um, oh, write this value to this index that's way too large, it crashes and you, you crash some of memory corruption, right? This is, this is a buffer overflow. Um, right, so, if you're going to use a buffer class and if you're a Node.js developer, uh, watch out with allocations. Um, sending those like memory over network can have disaster calls, because we saw that last year with Hardly, it can be really, really, really bad. Um, so if, if you're not a Node.js developer and perf is an, an absolute, absolute, absolute must on everything, the first thing you should do when you create a buffer is you should mem set it, um, if at all possible. Um, and if not, just be really, really careful that you're not sending out another size data. Um, Right. Secondly, for the buffer, I think the out of bound read and writes, uh, I, I think that's an implementation oversight. It'll probably get fixed, but it's weird that it doesn't match with the documentation at all. Right. Okay, so that's pretty much what I sort of, uh, um, what I came across in my Node.js research. And, and, um, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed it. I, I hope it was useful. Um, I think, uh, so Node.js, I mean, it's pretty similar to other runtime sort of applications. And, it battles with the same problems and that we've known for quite a while. And in other frameworks, language, web languages have too. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it sort of feels like, oh, did I saw this in, in a Perl script in 1998. And some of them are, are pretty cute, sort of nostalgic. Um, and then you get sort of these new, sort of cute new ones that I haven't seen really before in languages like that, like the, the buffer class. I think that's interesting. Um, and so I think there's, uh, Node.js stuff has some interesting areas for security research. Uh, I think there's a few few cool things we can still do there. Um, yeah, that's pretty much my talk. Um, yeah, go ahead. I don't think you mentioned dropping privileges, did you? I did not. You should do that. I will make a note of it. Thank you, sir. Because you need to start your own server pseudo again. Yeah, if, if you're going to port road by port 80, yes, absolutely. That is a really good point, sir. So I will make a note of that. Yes, I'll, absolutely. I will make a note of that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, have you uh, tried notifying the uh, project owners? <laughs> so, I, <laughs> it's on my to-do list. <laughs> well, I mean, for Node.js, right? 
for the, the GitHub ones, uh, I, 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 have, I, you know, I haven't even tracked these things. I just grep, I just basically grep for stuff that I wanted to include. And I was like, oh, this, this looks wrong. I'll, I'll copy paste. Well, I guess a more interesting question is the owners of Node.js project. Yeah, I, I still, so in, in particular the uh, the buffer work, like the out of bounds stuff. Yeah, I, I gotta go talk. I, get, I know the developers because I figured out who it was. I haven't mailed them yet, but it'll, it's a much, it'll basically, once I get out of this room, it's, it's what I, 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 I was up to 60 morning making slides because, you know, I, there were a few other things I had to do. So I haven't gotten around yet to emailing yet, but I will. Um, I mean, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think anybody's in danger for the buffer work stuff because, the way you do it is a little bit convoluted. Um, tech, in theory, yes, there's a security bug there. Um, I suspect no one is exposing this right now. Um, it, but I mean, it clearly is some kind of violation because at, at the very least, the documentation is completely inconsistent. Um, and I think should, something should be done there. And I will be informing um, uh, the developers that just haven't gotten to it yet. Right. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Did you look at all the security of NPM and I have not. I have not. It's, it's one of the things I want to do. I, I hear you. I think, and I know there's a project out there that does these periodic security reviews of, of stuff that goes through NPM. Um, I haven't. I haven't looked at most of that stuff yet. Um, but I know there's a project that does that. Any other questions? Awesome. Great. Uh, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>